Hi, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Um, I am Katie Domrat. I am the new adult programs coordinator. Um, if you have attended one of these before, you will probably recognize Izzy here. Uh, Izzy Fuqua used to be my position, but she is now the interpretation and digital project coordinator, as well as the Isaac Julian um, Lessons of the Hour educator. And today she's going to present her 3 and 30 called Legendary. So I will pass it on off to Izzy. Thank you so much, Katie. Uh, <laughs> thank you for joining this morning. Um, we are going to look at three works of art in the modern and contemporary galleries and end with our special exhibition. Um, Specifically, these artists are looking to the past, to historic figures, but also to mythic figures uh, in their work to make sense of something going on in their present and therefore making that relevant to our lives today. So we are going to start with our um, first work of art, which is on view in the 21st Century Gallery. Uh, so this work of art is currently on view in our 21st Century Galleries. Those are the ones that are just above the entrance to the museum. And uh, this is where I would ask the audience what they see. But since you can't tell me, I will just tell you what I see. Uh, this work of art is a square shape and um, has some kind of muddy tones to it, some reds, browns, uh, whites, and grays. We can also see um, some different line qualities, maybe some dotted lines in certain areas, and then rough and jagged lines. Uh, this work of art is made out of tin, so we're definitely getting some of that organic quality coming from rusting of the material. It also has nails in it, which you can see kind of here, and then these puncture holes are also from um, someone taking a nail and puncturing that tin. Now, uh, if we look very, very closely, we can start to maybe see something that we recognize. And I'm just going to point out this figure here. The artist has noted that this is important by adjusting the line quality. We can see that it's um, parallel lines in some sort of form. So let's take a closer look at what that form could be. And we're going to get a clue in the title of the artwork. The Inferior Man That Proved Hitler Wrong. This is by an artist named Ronald Lockett and it was made in 1995. Um, so if we think about that title, The Inferior Man That Proved Hitler Wrong, uh, we are of course thinking about Jesse Owens, who is now on screen. Jesse Owens was a uh, famous athlete and an Olympic athlete. He famously won four gold medals at the Berlin Olympic Games in 1936. And that's the important date here because who are we talking about? We're talking about Berlin, 1936, just before World War II. Adolf Hitler is in power and promoting his pro Aryan race. Um, uh, beliefs and that was not immune in the sports world. So he believed that the Olympic Games should not feature people who did not look um, of that Aryan ideal. But uh, people sent, um, uh, the U.S. sent an entire um, team of African-American athletes, including Jesse Owens, who did famously medal four times. Now, um, where is Jesse Owens in this work? Now, pardon my uh, line art drawing. I will also tra trace it with my cursor. But if you just shift Jesse in your mind, um, kind of in profile, we see his head here bent, his shoulder line above it, two arms coming down. You can almost even see that musculature of that arm and kind of ending in a fist on the track. And then the curved at the back, and the legs in foreshadow going back into space. We're seeing Jesse Owens in this work at the moment of the starting line, right? He's not in motion yet. He's not taking off in a sprint. He's not even on a winner's block being presented a medal. He's at this moment of expected potential, right? So why did Ronald Lockett, an artist who uh, was born in 1965 um, and is working in um, the 80s and 90s, why is he creating um, work that features Jesse Owens, um, a, a person who uh, meant a lot in the 60s? 
And I think what we're reading here is this um, potential, this, this energy built up and ready to be released and to ultimately prove someone wrong. So the inferior man that proved Hitler wrong, there, he's referencing Jesse Owens, and he's seeing himself in that. Ronald Lockett was an African-American artist uh, born and raised in Bessemer, Alabama. As I said, he was kind of straddled this time frame of post-civil rights movement. Um, so the rights were technically afforded to African Americans, but as we know, that time frame, uh, especially in the Deep South, did not um, follow those uh, amendments to our laws. And so Lockett um, coming of age in that area, I think is reflecting on Jesse Owens as this figure in his mind, this person who reached such potential and proved people wrong about what he was capable of. So this is our first artist that we um, uh, see referencing someone in the past to bring his story uh, to his audience and make it relevant. So we are going to move on to our next work of art now. Um, and this one should be no stranger to many of our attendees who uh, uh, join us for these events. Um, this is Anselm Kiefer's Landscape with Wing, created in 1981. This work of art will always be on view um, in the mid to late 20th century galleries. Uh, and the reason I say that is because it is huge. For those of you who aren't familiar with uh, Kiefer's work, they are often incredibly large. The work in our galleries are, is 10 feet by 18 feet. Um, and it's meant to kind of envelope you, overwhelm you, make you just take a step back and uh, take it all in because there's a lot to see. So let's go, oh, sorry, let's go back to our main image here. So we are, um, Kiefer isn't pro quite providing us a lot of information. He's telling us it's a landscape and there's a wing, so that's helpful. Um, but let's talk about how we see a landscape here. Uh, it's helpful that it's in landscape orientation. Maybe we're seeing a bit of a horizon line at the top here, um, suggested by this kind of gray, blue, muddy color at top that we don't quite see in such a pure form. So I'd like to read that as sky at the top. Um, and then this horizon line kind of breaking up the two planes. We also see these uh, relatively parallel lines that create this rhythm across the painting, help your eye to move around. And uh, some people have read that as fields, um, you know, how from far above, like far above, you can see these uh, patterns in earth. Um, and that's something that has been seen as well. But if we look uh, very, very closely, um, you can start to see some texture. Uh, it looks bumpy, rough. Uh, the, the color is also um, dark. We're seeing lots of blacks and grays, browns, a couple of whites here and there. And then most notably, we do see that wing at center. And if you can tell, it's a little bit more difficult in the digital image. Let's see if we can, yeah, you can see it better here in this gallery shot. It is suspended over the canvas and you can even see a bit of cast shadow, giving you the idea that this is meant to contrast from the painting. Um, so this work is created using um, oil, straw, and it's directly put on the canvas. Uh, that's very evident in person. And I'm just going to show you a detail here of some of that uh, like organic material that you can see. Um, and then at right here, what I'm showing you is a picture of post-World War II uh, Germany. Uh, Anselm Kiefer was born in the months leading up to the end of World War II. So similar to Lockett in that sense, kind of was born um, of a time that wasn't directly related to the atrocities of World War II, but that post uh, time period was something to reconcile with as well. And Kiefer turned to his art to do that. Um, he, uh, um, very famously would be exploring his country's past, trying to understand the decisions that were made, um, and he would look to his art to kind of allude to that conflict um, and that devastation. So that makes a bit more sense now that we're looking at the way this canvas is handled. It's very rough. It's um, energetic. It, it looks painful. It looks like a burn and torn um, landscape, which is obviously what Kiefer was taking in visually. 
Um, but that wing, that wing is the important part, right? And um, so who is Kiefer referencing? He is looking to a mythic um, person here. Uh, his name is Wayland. He is a metalsmith um, who was imprisoned. And uh, in order to escape his imprisonment, he fashioned some metal wings um, and, and escaped. So here we see that symbol of Wayland kind of above and on top of this landscape, the idea that you can escape uh, from your prison, you can rise above it. It's, it's a symbol of redemption. And Kiefer uses wings often in his work. If you just do a quick search for Kiefer, you can see sometimes he has wings on open books, the idea that books can set you free. Um, so he is very much interested in this idea of redemption and moving on from something that has occurred. Uh, okay, so that was our second work and we are going to move right along to our third and final stop on our gallery talk, which uh, is of course our special exhibition. Um, Isaac Julian Lessons of the Hour, Frederick Douglass. Uh, it is open now at VMFA. It does not require tickets. Uh, you just need to make your way on up to um, kind of the old wing near the African Art Galleries. It's in what we call our Evans Court Galleries. And you can just walk in and take a look. Just a little bit of setup. This is a, a filmic installation um, across 10 screens and Prior to the 10 screens, there is an antechamber with three uh, photographs, specifically a process called tintypes. Um, so three tintypes and then uh, one film that's played across 10 screens. The film total runtime is about 28 minutes. Um, so a lot that full amount. It is something that I would recommend seeing from start to finish. Um, you could pop in in the middle and see it to the other, um, see it to the, to where you came, um, came in from, but I, I would recommend taking it all in because it's incredibly powerful. So the entrance to the exhibition, like I said, had three tin types, and this is a popular form of photography during Frederick Douglass's time, which is why we're seeing it here. The three tin types are actually images of the actors in the film. So um, here we see Anna Murray Douglas, who is uh, Frederick Douglass's first wife. At center, we have Frederick Douglass. And at right, we have uh, J.P. Ball, who is the photographer that Frederick Douglass worked frequently with in uh, capturing his image and likeness. And we'll touch back on J.P. Ball when we kind of go through the film piece by piece. I did want to acknowledge that I am not going to show any excerpts of the film. Um, it is meant to be an immersive experience. You step into this room, there's red carpeting everywhere. Let me go back to my gallery still here, actually. Uh, yeah, let me show you it here. So you step into this room, it's dark. These uh, 10 film screens are kind of interplaced uh, along um, this circular um, space for you. Um, it is projected from behind and the walls are red. And the sound just sort of takes you in, very similar to Kiefer. You are meant to feel like you are stepping into an episode of Douglas's life, that you are walking with him through these areas and these times and hearing his words. So I didn't want to show just a little excerpt on YouTube. They're there if, um, if you want to go and find them, but I really do recommend you coming and seeing it. Another reason I didn't want to show you just an excerpt is because it is a um, uh, multi multi pieced presentation of the same content. So that's best displayed here. We can see a tree with some foliage. We can see uh, the Frederick Douglass actor right here standing near that same tree. Uh, we can see different aspects of the same story. And that's important because later on in the film, we start to see images being interspersed into the film that have to do with our contemporary life. So um, there is a single screen version of this artwork, but it is not something that we have access to. The work we own is what you see here. And it's that kind of multi-view version. So again, highly recommend you come in and see it in person. 
Okay, so let's pop back real quick. I just wanted to kind of focus on the Douglas tintype just as an introduction to who he is. I'm sure um, many of us know a lot about Frederick Douglass, but just so we're all on the same page, um, he was born enslaved and uh, es escaped enslavement and went on to be a masterful writer, orator, uh, and one of, the, one of history's greatest activists for freedom and equality, um, but also an advocate for women's suffrage. And that comes into play in the film as well. Um, so here we can see the tintype of the actor um, playing in the film and uh, then Douglas's portrait. Uh, so a pretty good likeness. Uh, and again, hearing those words in the film is incredibly powerful. So here is the, the display of the film in our um, galleries. And so why Douglas? Why did Isaac Julian, a British filmmaker, come to the US and say, Let's let's do a work about Douglas. Um, the Rochester Art, uh, sorry, the Memorial Art Gallery in Rochester, New York, was working on a series of um, asking 21st century artists to respond to place, to come up with a work of art that responded to place. And so Isaac Julian was one of those artists. He came to Rochester, which is where uh, Frederick Del Douglas is buried. He's buried in Mount Hope Cemetery. Um, and famously, this uh, statue that you're seeing on screen is in Highland Park in Rochester. It was erected in 1899 and is the first statue of an African-American in the country. Uh, so that's notable. And that stuck with Julian. He uh, was in he was recalling that he was in the park and he just looked up at the statue and said, my God, this man, and I'm using quotes now, uh, born in 1818 is extraordinary. A light bulb went off, end quote. And he said, I need to tell his story. And I need to tell his story because uh, when Julian was visiting in 2019, the U.S. was dealing with many uh, instances of police brutality. And um, uh, the one that Julian references in this piece is are the Freddie Gray riots from 2015. So four years earlier in Baltimore, um, Freddie Gray was murdered and um, uh, Julian was looking at Douglas's image and reading his words and seeing that there was a commonality to what's happening in America today. So he went to work. Uh, he hired actors. He traveled uh, across the globe. He went to the UK, Washington, DC, um, specifically London and Scotland um, in the UK, um, DC, and then Rochester, and filmed various episodes of Douglas's life that he felt paired with his three speeches um, that he chose to portray. So um, just quickly, the who, the what, um, what we're seeing here are some of the key characters. Uh, it's Douglas, Douglas's first wife, Anna Murray. His second wife, Helen Pitts, is also featured. Um, suffragist Susan B. Anthony um, and his uh, relationship with her. Um, and then another important relationship is uh, J.P. Ball, the, the pioneering African-American photographer who we can see right here. Um, so what... Um, what are the speeches that you will hear? Uh, and, and I'm sorry, this is uh, showing Scotland uh, where he did famously travel and deliver over 300 lectures on um, uh, abolition. Uh, let's, sorry, I keep losing my mouse. Um, so uh, the one of the speeches is lecture on pictures um, and that examines the uh, influence of technology and um, images on human relations. Um, and this is especially poignant as we consider Douglas's legacy. Like I said, he had a very close relationship with J.P. Ball who captured his image in tintype in photography. Um, he, Douglas is famously uh, one of the most photographed men um, of the 19th century. It's said that he has over 100, 160 photographs and portraits. Um, 
So here is an example of a still from a film from the film of him in that photography studio, sitting, waiting to have that portrait taken. And, and why is that important? It's, it's because Douglas believed that he could subvert this idea of what the African American is, who they are. Um, if the image is controlled by the oppressor, they will show what uh, what they want to be, how they want um, African Americans to be seen. But Douglas, this well spoken, well versed, um, educated, important person, uh, wanted to control that image and present that to the world. That's why that was so important. Um, the other two speeches, and sorry, I'll go back. There we go. The other two speeches are. Um, what to the Slave is the 4th of July. And uh, in, that, um, in that speech, we see not only Douglas speaking, but then uh, interspersed moments of um, 4th of July parades, fireworks going off, moments of celebration. And it gives you pause thinking about, well, what does the 4th of July mean to those who were emancipated um, or in his time, not yet emancipated, but what does this holiday mean when it means freedom to many, but not all? Uh, and then the final uh, speech is Lessons of the Hour, the title of the work. Um, and, and that speech really discusses uh, uh, episodes of lynching and um, suffrage. And that's where we see those images of the Freddie Gray protest in Baltimore in 2015. It's actually the FBI surveillance footage. So it's kind of from shot from above and it's a, a dark cityscape with light surging and um, people converging. Um, and, and famously this, this idea of the influence of technology on the images, the idea that um, that surveillance footage was used um, to prosecute people um, and, 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 and levy punishment um, for their involvement. So Julian is interested in this kind of progression of what the image does and what impact it has on society. We had Isaac Julian visit and give an artist talk in early December. You can hear from him. Uh, when he was here, he spoke really poetically about the fact, you know, this work was made in 2019 and, and what happened the very next year, but George Floyd's murder and just this cycle of everything happening again, which underscores this point, right? That uh, we can learn from our histories. We can look back to people like, um, we can look back to people like Frederick Douglass, like Jesse Owens, uh, Wayland, mythic, but, and, and what can we learn from them? Uh, how can we help for uh, future generations? Um, and actually, uh, yeah, Isaac had a great quote that um, I kind of stuck with me. Uh, One reason for making the work is reviewing what America is today, where it comes from. And I, I think that's really important, especially as we think about the charge moving forward. All right. Thanks so much, Izzy. Uh, once again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Izzy. Um, what a great 3 and 30 this month. Great way to start out 2023.